In this episode of the Music Bed Podcast, we chat with writing and directing duo and founders of neighborhood film company, Ricky Staub and Dan Walser. We go behind the scenes on their recent Netflix film, Concrete Cowboy, starring Idris Elba. Like when I think about getting Concrete Cowboy off the ground, you know, getting Idris Elba on board, he watched the short, which the cage is essentially Concrete Cowboy, but no horses. And the cage for me was my deciding factor whether I was going to actually call myself a director or not. I went into that with like my entire heart. Action, go get it to me. Action, where the f you been? Where the f have you been? We didn't cross over to this from like the apex of the commercial industry. The splash can be behind closed doors. Also, joining the conversation is their rep, Michael Cooper, one of the founders of Range Media Partners, representing actors and filmmakers like Michael Fassbender and Taron Edgerton to screenwriters like Eric Singer of Top Gun Maverick. When something's good, though, having done this for 27 years, people find it. There are really smart representatives out there that take the time to mine and have that thirst for discovery. This podcast is a production of Musicbed, the standard in music licensing for film, TV, and advertising. To create your free account today, go to musicbed.com. Ricky, Dan, could you guys give me like the story of how you guys first met Michael? We came to know Coop through, or as we know him as Coop. And I'll call him Coop from the. From yeah, the yeah. Coop I is prefer a game that. Rolls cool. right off the tongue. Mike yeah. is not me. That's a Dateline episode, and Michael is <laughs> Michael is if we're in a fight or I'm driving the car the wrong way. Yeah. Okay. Coop. Uh, I don't. I forget. We met Coop. I think on a project Black River, uh, a book that he found. I think your mom gave you. Mother-in-law. Mother-in-law. Yeah. Gave him this book written by uh, this amazing woman about father and son story in a neo-Western, um, just so much soul and passion to it. And yeah, he sent us this book because he had read, I think, a script of ours. That was how we were introduced. I got on a Zoom and, you know, I love it. They, they, Ricky's to the left, Dan's to the <laughs> right. And I got halfway through and this dude respectfully was like, hold on, I, I want your flow to continue. I read it last night in one sitting, fucking blew me away. Then Duder over here says, uh, I'll, it'll be read by tomorrow. The next day it was like, the book found all of us. Yeah. There was no, I'm not a conductor. I didn't have some genius. Like there was intuition and, and now knowing them even more energetically, I know at least where my heart, what, what it looks for for them. And, and I'll shut up. You, you continue. No, I, that, I mean, that was essentially after that. What's the name of the book again? Black River. Black River. Yeah, and uh, yeah, we got to meet Tim Van Patten, who's going to direct it. And he's just another Incredible. soulful, amazing human. Um, he's done some like Sopranos episodes. Again. Yeah, God. I mean, he's like Mount Rushmore in the storytelling world, like Boardwalk. Like he's a, he's a legend. Yeah. Game but, of Thrones. Uh, yeah. It was just such a like spiritual connection with this guy i remember we told rich we we're like so it makes sense if coop's just like in our in our squad with us like because we kept wanting to call him or text him yeah. about other things we were thinking about and was there like a period of time where you guys are trying to find something like this but it just kind of went through phases of you mean like representation yeah. um no i mean in some ways i think we were really fortunate because the short film that we did the cage is what opened doors up and that's actually um the path there was we made the short then one of the uh, women that was a producer with us stacy shared it with jeff waxman and jen madeloff who are two producers she had worked with it was just like one of those things she was just really proud of the work um, but he watched the short and the next day is like i want to come meet these guys and they live in wow. new york so they drove down and had lunch with us i'm curious and maybe michael you have something to say about this but i'm curious what it was and Maybe in hindsight, you guys have an opinion. What what was it about that short that you think kind of grasped some attention to it? It wasn't like it won at Sundance or TIFF or anything. It was just online, right? Yeah. Like yeah. you just put it out. I know Film Supply had a little bit to do with it, but like. I don't think we got a single commercial out of it, first of all. No. Yeah. I mean, it just kind of, yeah, it just kind of existed. We, we put it in some festivals and it, it won. Um, what was the one that it won? Heartland. Heartland. That made us like an Oscar um, consideration. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but it, it did it, win some festivals, but not like the sun dances and the. Right. right. I, I think it was like a, it didn't get a million views. It got the right views. I was going to say, when something's good, though, having done this for 20 something years, people find it. 
Like right. it, it opens the door. Quality's quality and talent's talent, even if it's seen by like very few and doesn't win that whatever that thing, right. that trophy from whatever, it'll find the right person, I yeah. believe. No, I think you're, I mean, it's that's what's fascinating to me is it like, because it still feels like, especially in the short realm or the feature realm, there's kind of gatekeepers to perception of your movie or your short, whatever. But I think the way that you guys put it out and the response from it is very telling of like, the idea that you can just be some kid in Iowa that that has an idea, has just enough resources, you know, and to, there, to make there something. And there are passionate people on my end that don't it, don't just read like the bullet points, right. you know? They go way deeper looking for inspiration. Yeah. And you find it, It's because it's there. Yeah. Is there something, is there, can you tell us a story of something maybe that you held on to that just didn't work out? Like something that you like kind of believed in? Yeah, it just yeah, didn't yeah, out. yeah. I, I, here's the, what we, you learn from your mistakes. Like I, th I carry my mistakes with me everywhere so that you learn from them. It's not that I'll never, I, I was remaking Old Boy, the Chan Park Wook movie. You know, with Brolin back when I worked with him and looking back, I mean, I want to just go, bro, that was a masterpiece. What were you thinking? At best, you're going to be half as good. Yeah. <laughs> but why touch like... You're so right though, because it's not a bad movie. It's like a, it's a pretty good movie, but it, in just comparison... It's hard to for me the, to separate the two. To, yeah. Because I think you're kind of right, but I still don't like it's not I don't think we sure. but we tried and we missed. Yeah. But you don't touch great. It, it wasn't anyone's fault. Yeah. Like I've learned that. If you ask about one big mistake, it's like, no, leave that painting on that wall. Yeah. And appreciate it. But it, there is some I don't know, like it is kind of fascinating which IP they choose to do. Because some of them you're Correct. like, I do need that. Correct. I do want that. You're you know absolutely, I mean? there's not a science and I would never make a sweeping judgment. Like, again, people talking, I remember this was 10 years ago. I heard that one studio was remaking Slapshot. I was like, no, you, no you're not. <laughs> <laughs> you know, right. but then there are some random things. And the truth is you could remake Slapshot because the younger people haven't seen Newman in that. Yeah. I'm also Canadian and it's like a cult, it's like a, Mount Rushmore film for me of Paul Newman's. It's a, you got to pick the right one and have a punk rock or a completely rebirth of yeah, the, yeah. and not try and copy it. So it's that's a that's a landmine situation, and you got to have conviction and something brand new and alive. Do you guys think about sort of like future projects, certain IPs that are kind of like dream? situations for remakes do you guys have like a list for of those? remakes maybe not a remake or like a reimagining or something from your childhood or something that you're like I feel like if we talk about it someone's gonna take it yeah <laughs> That's a good one. we did have this conversation i can't remember what which ones we came up with because there was like there was so many happening like where there's like all these like 90s movies 80s and 90s movies that were being like reimagined and so it, we started talking i'm trying to think of I'm like, what does Rookie of the Year look like? Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think I'd, as a director, I mean, writing, you can maybe hide behind it a little bit, but direct. You don't I, like I gravitate toward. I'm not going to touch something that I've revered. Like, yeah. It just, yeah. unless you're like doing well, like maybe the Top was, Gun route, which is like building right. off of it. Like, what's this character you're in the future? You're extending you're a extending universe. It, yeah. Not trying to remake it. Yeah. Yeah. I could get into that, but touching. I was, dude, I was so nervous when. Denny was doing Dune and just because of the stories of every single failed attempt at doing that. But when it came out, I was like, thank God, dude. Yeah. It's like so Yeah, good. I mean, some people, I guess, they hit it. and it, yeah. yeah. But mine would be heavyweights for sure. You dude, but see, you can't touch that. <laughs> Who's going to play Ben Stiller's character? Ben Stiller, I think. <laughs> yeah. Come back it's, and just... But that's see, just, only if you did, 25 like, years later. What is, yeah, what does oh, he look like? still there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's yeah, a whole layer. I mean, that becomes almost a drama at that point. <laughs> right. It's just like, what are you still doing that's there? That's my idea. It's like slowly, a slow descent into madness <laughs> as opposed to a comedy. Yeah, he hasn't come out of his cabin in right. so long. <laughs> All it takes is some, like, some people sitting around the table going, okay, here's my angle. And what do you, th like, and it's not like I know. 
This podcast is a production of Musicbed, the standard in music licensing for film, TV, and advertising. From indie artists on the rise to leading composers, Musicbed has curated the best roster of musicians for your films. Go to musicbed.com and use the promo code NEIGHBORHOOD to get your first month free on a standard subscription. When somebody brings you something, what's sort of the vetting process for you to make sure that it's legit? Like when you first met these guys, like... You mean a piece of material? Yeah, if I if if I come to you with you know uh, a script or something, and I I have maybe one feature or no features or no TV, you know, like I'm still early it's in my a, career. I, I, if something moves asking, yeah. me, if something's great, game on. Yeah. But what are you, uh, if I'm just trying to ask questions in my podcast now? Yeah, um, the Dan Show. I'm here. curious though, like um, <laughs> the vetting for you. What does the presentation need to look like? The material itself, That's I know you're going to be open about, but like what. Are there things that maybe you haven't even articulated, but like I need, I kind of need these things in play to be like, this is material I'm gonna engage. Usually, you know, there's so much that comes at you. And I used to, when I was coming up, I tried to read it all. Um, now it helps when it comes from someone whose taste I respect. And there are a lot of people I've, as you do this long enough, I, you know, there's a consistency, whether it's the right thing or not, taste is taste. And I rely on that. I usually want to get a hook in my mouth and then and then I'm just I labor I like to read cover to cover I don't like to skip a paragraph and then I let it sit and whether it's a guy who's or a girl has lady has no credits it's game on it's this is incredible I think this goes back to what you're talking about like the kind of the hopeful element of it at least this is our experience because you know I think a lot of commercial filmmakers are obviously like trying to figure out what the bridge is and I've, everyone knows it's different it's for mystery everyone sometimes, right it is know? a mystery and i think you know at least speaking from our experience it's like we didn't cross over to this from like the apex of the commercial industry we had a production company but it's like we we were not making like top tier commercial known you know like in any way so we might as well have been in some sense unknown in that space there's a mystery element to it but there's also i think like a hopeful element that like the splash can be behind closed doors because i think Yes, there's like a very high wall, to, it feels like, to get it to someone who can make decisions. What I found with the right people is like, they don't care about how you got over the wall. Like, they're not like, right. what was your career before this? Right. It's like, College. this material this material got to me, so I'm going to engage it. It was the same thing with Concrete Cowboy, um, that you're not making something, you're not trying to make something that everyone loves. Yeah. Obviously, a, a strong group of people need to love it. But like the cage for me at a point in my life where um, I think Dan was really the only one that knew it at the time, but it was my deciding factor whether I was going to actually call myself a filmmaker, call myself a director or not. I needed to know because Dan and I had been writing, writing for that at that point for over 10 years and us saying to each other, like, no one's going to watch our Xfinity campaign and be like, man, right. let's give these guys two hours and, you know, right. $2 million. Like, it's never going to happen. And so the cage to me was like, I was leaving nothing. I was leaving it all out on the field. Um, and it was for me, like, if this bombed and was terrible, I was going to be done, yeah. like, sincerely. Um, and so I went into that with, like, my entire heart. Like, I wanted people to know who we were as artists and I felt the weight of that as us as like representing like what we would write in the future. Um, and it was the same way with Concrete Cowboy. It was like we gave our soul to that project because of how committed we were to that community, to Eric and Mill, who we wrote. It was just like, this is everything I have yeah. is coming out of me. Um, and we're trying to retain that even into future projects. But I think a practical takeaway I'd say that we still do as we're trying to win jobs is how much of the gap can we close for the decision maker? Like when I think about getting Concrete Cowboy off the ground, you know, or getting Idris Elba on board or like a financier, it's like, here's the work, but here's showing how we made it. Um, you know, I put together a huge presentation, like a deck that's like 50 pages deep of the movie, how I see it cinematically, emotionally, the characters, you know, the backstory of who they are and why they're important to the, like, as much as like I can shrink the gap for the decision making, um, requires a lot of upfront work. Like a job we're on now, where we were pitching, it ended up like put together like a 50-page, you know, custom image deck that yeah. then I 
had to narrate in front of Jake Gyllenhaal. <laughs> very well, by the way. Oh, I wish I was there. We made him that. cry. We made him cry. So true story. Um, there was actually some hit, like we, in the first go around, we didn't go the distance to like paint the picture for them. And well, thankfully we got another shot to get in front of them. And I was like, yeah, we need to shrink the gap here. Like, so we broke out the entire movie and basically did all the work. And by the um, way, and again, uh, this is another thing that I think if you're spending years in the commercial space becomes an enormous asset when you get to this place. A, because you've actually made things. So you can speak yeah, to, yeah. I'm not just an artist in the field painting flowers. Good luck with all that yeah. logistical stuff. You've had to pitch. You've had to pitch and you've had to, I mean, we know from commercials, we have to pitch it where it's like, would you like me to shoot the commercial for you right, right. now? Can I just go shoot and then the show you it and, and, then you you'll, and then you'll select me of the three that you have to, right. you know, source. Yeah, I have no frustration about the process at yeah, all, but, sure. but it's like, <laughs> we'll go into this later. Yeah, but, sure. but, it, but I, I'm saying that, that all of a sudden again becomes like, uh, nothing is wasted. I mean, that's like the thing it's like, that's been so beautiful to watch. It's like, even when it felt like we were just like writing for no one, making commercials that were, you know, by committee as they are a lot of times. And then all of a sudden we're in a room where the concept of get it all the way to the point where they have to, like they can see it so they can say yes, is something we did a thousand times for commercials and it became an asset. Um, and it wasn't something where we were like artists that were like, what? And they don't trust my judgment. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna just like flow and then you say yes. And I think at least for me, that that discipline of getting those butterflies and having that urgency and having to go through those steps is healthy. You never should be, in my opinion, I never want to be sitting back. I want to get a little anxious. I want to use that anxiety to to my benefit. Well, is 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 the work ethic like something that you look for immediately to work with somebody? Oh, I mean, you just know dedication and passion when you see it. Um, everyone's got their own. I I, I like people who are. I'm learning to be balanced. So work ethic in whatever way it comes out, you know, when you're seeing someone, you know, Bradley's a friend of mine, Bradley Cooper, he, his level of conviction and commitment is off the charts. He's a force of nature. You know it when you see it in people. And I, I just hearing that story, I love that. Like, I, I wanna get a little anxious. I wanna get a little uncomfortable. It's healthy. You're always, you're pushing. That's a good thing. I was going to say one other practical thing too. Like I know we talked about this with the Black River uh, story. It's kind of funny that I read it that fast, and then Ricky read it that fast. But I was forced to read it that fast. You were forced it's to read it that fast. But I think I think that's actually gotten us the opportunity to win projects is being fast readers. Like I know that sounds incredibly practical, but I'm I'm often surprised when I'm talking to other filmmakers, particularly that are trying to like make a jump yeah. from commercial. And I'm like, I really like your style. Like, hey, you should check this out. And they like get back to me three months later. I'm like, you that ship is so yeah. sailed because you, that, so that, much, told, that told me everything I need to know. Because all it does, and again, I don't, I'm not looking for you to show me that this is your idol and you'll give your entire life to it. Like you'll dismiss your family or anything like that. It's nothing, nothing that intense, but it is something that you can start to see is like, are you gonna have the passion to overcome the ridiculous amount of failure you're gonna face? Yep. And if, if reading a book is a hill you can't climb quick, it's not gonna go well. Like, and also we're just not gonna really jive because it's just like, we're always so aware of like, no matter what it is for sent material, like that is someone saying, do you respect my time? I take the time to give you this because I think you'd be interested, yeah. whether we like it or not, like let's read this. I was like, I had a conversation yesterday with an executive that we're passing on the script, but he was like, man, I just love you guys. Like. I send it to you and like a day or two later, I get a read. He's like, I'm usually sitting here for like a month or yeah. two. He loves that we're just engaged. You know, that Gage, I've learned is the most yeah. respectful thing is like, you don't have to, saying no to a script or a book isn't disrespectful. Like everything right. we get sent isn't gonna resonate. That's usually the case for directing too. It's kind of like feeling like, is this a project? Then it becomes a conversation between, is this something that we wanna just live with as writers? Right with in, in the best case black river with tim like in collaboration with the director which is fantastic i would say what's fun though about some of the writing opportunities we have had with other directors like tim 
is knowing what the, that director's capable of. And kind of writing for that. Yes, yeah. and then knowing that they're going to execute it is like, I'd say even for me as a director, getting to interface with like Tim and like we got to work with like Chad Stahelski on the John Wick thing. It was like, I don't ever get really a front row seat to other directors' processes. And because you're their writer, they like bring you into it. I think the uh, interesting thing, the idea of just kind of writing and writing for nobody is so hard for people to like grasp the importance of, you know, like what was something that you guys learned through that process in terms of, other than being better writers and like being. I mean, but that like, to be honest, I'm so grateful a that Dan and I share the same intensity of writing, <clears throat> but by the time we made the cage and people wanted to see what we had next, that was always a conversation. And I was trying to tell filmmakers, like if you make something great, you better be ready to be like, this is what I want to make next. Cause no one's going to sit around and hand you anything. Like we never look for, I mean, Coop did hand us Black River, which was incredible. Um, and I guess Smuggler as well. So maybe. I guess. <laughs> so this I was is gonna, just a I, great anecdote. This is a great <laughs> anecdote that's falling apart before I even get it out. Because the point was that like Dan and I are always like very hungry to create. And so like with the cage, we already had Concrete Cowboy like written. We had another script still but maybe it's important like, i think to even go back way before that like because talking about when no one was reading your script i was a high school english teacher yeah teaching american literature and writing he was working for a producer like got i mean 15 hours a day or something crazy and we would i mean we tried to get ourselves under a contract when we started writing together not in like a week but just like to hold each other accountable when literally no one was going to read our stuff probably i mean we thought we were going to win an academy award so you do kind of have to have like a we always Almost, had this like you have to have an irrational confidence in some sense or belief but we we would i would get up at 5 a.m he would get up at 5 a.m we would write all week designated scenes that we had outlined and then he would come to my school in pasadena we would get a lucky boy burrito in pasadena if you have not had one they're the size of a football and they're delicious you fed all day yeah <laughs> get that in a, in a large coffee and we would we would write inside my classroom and you know, the reward for finishing the draft was to, we got to write another one. That yeah. was like the reward essentially, because we obviously send it to people, you try to like throw your Hail, Hail Marys and then obviously it wouldn't happen. So it wasn't like, I don't want to paint it as like Rocky training here. It was very demoralizing a lot of the time. We would go and like, you know, submit our stuff to the Nickel Fellowship and get to the semifinals, which is just enough to like let you know, you're probably good, but you're not that good and you'll never make it. You know, like it was like these constant failures um but it only kind of like strengthened our our resolve um to to continue but i do think like you know we're joking but it, no one really did know that we were writers right it was not applicable information as you're pitching a commercial but just right. so you know so, we've written seven scripts like yeah. it's like they <laughs> they don't care like no one cares and so it's another one of those examples where all of a sudden after the short we're coming into this room and are like we years of writing, thing. our years of writing becomes now valuable. Yeah. And we haven't changed our process at all. We do the exact, I mean, we don't obviously have to teach and do other things, but like our writing process is literally identical to what it was when we were in our early 20s right. and doing it for no one. And I think that one thing that I, at least we like to do with our scripts is make it its own work of art mm. because we never, we, I mean, we had the naive, well, I guess it wasn't naive because it's worked out, but like the desire to have make movies one day, but we assume that this thing is only going to live and die <clears throat> on the page. So we take it so seriously that people have an experience reading the script like they would a book. Whereas I think a lot of other filmmakers feel like the script is just like a thing that has to be done sure. to get the thing made. But I think that it creates laziness and holes that find their way onto the screen. And so we like meticulously paint because we want people to be like, even if this thing never gets made, it's in itself an experience to behold. But, but so to get a little existential, cause I really, I really believe this. Some people are really talented that don't get the shot. And to that, I say there are really smart representatives out there that take the time to mine under, underneath and find and, and, and have that thirst for discovery. Yeah. Part of what I think helps you, makes you authentic 
is your ability to hold your craft loosely as not the end of your identity. I think that's what allows you to write something that will never be read mm -hmm. and hold and it holds value. It allows you to work on something for 10 years and it never sees the light of day because the process matters, mm -hmm. but it also doesn't define you. That's such a good point. It's like, because it feels like delusion mm -hmm. when you're in the middle of oh, it, yeah. you know what I mean? Where you're like, this will work out, especially if we have wives and kids. It's like, yeah. babe, I'm going to do this for free. Trust me. <laughs> At some point, it's going to come back and it's going to be great. You know, it takes a very sort of special situation for that to all work out, you know. Um, at the core of it, you're kind of like, you're writing something, whether you know no one's going to read it or not. It means that you like value thought. You know what I mean? Like, I'm just going to value the time that I get to just create. Yeah, and it is. It's beautiful, but it's also an enormous like trap. We already live in a culture that's like, you're defined by what you do. Yeah. In our environment, you're defined by what you make. Right. So what happens? You just if, made. Or you just made. But what yeah. happens if nothing you do ever gets made right so like the the journey of it like an artist i feel like is to like recognize that your value is in something else we've had the chance now to meet and speak to a lot of younger filmmakers and you can just tell it's like the saying dan has taped on his monitor that i love is you know to enjoy it fully but hold it loosely mm -hmm. and i don't think a lot of people are enjoying it because they're just literally like death gripping the opportunity and I think it breeds, it doesn't breed great work. You know, I think going back to like something I didn't know was so tangible in the cage and in Concrete Cowboy was like, just how much it mattered to me that I did this right and did it well and did it in a holistic way um, is really important, so. Usually like someone's first feature does not have a name talent in it. Usually there's like a come up process of, you're, you're making something for $100,000 or you're making something for half a million dollars or something. Like, how did you commit to, was there a commitment early on to just like, we have to find maybe not just the right person, but somebody that people would know? What, like, what was that conversation like? There was a good timing thing where Idris was looking to sink his teeth into something that his company could produce and he could star gotcha. in. It was the script itself to him was just beautiful. Again, it was like, not trying to pat ourselves on the back, but again, we were like, we're very precious about making the read yeah. like an experience. And so that engaged him, but then he watched the short, which the cage is essentially concrete cowboy if you, but no horses. So there's a smaller gap of like, right. I kind of get a sense of how these guys would pull this off. Um, and then I had the treatment that I had put together that explained a lot of like how we wanted to go about it. Um, and so, yeah, but him, we are obviously struck gold with Idris cause he adds a lot of value. Give me some uh, some details for listeners, and maybe Michael, you you might have an opinion on the receiving side of this, but give me some like pitch necessary, like thoughts. You know what I mean? I mean, I think you want all the like the elements that we talked about, like something that's really built out. Like again, for commercial filmmakers, this is not going to be a new thing. It's you know, it's a really built out treatment, which obviously has some elements that maybe you don't have in a commercial treatment. But I think being um, aware of like what's your what's your approach as a filmmaker but also what's your approach to the process of making this I think, okay interesting like i think that was an enormous part of concrete uh and getting idris is he was fascinated by the idea of including half of the cast being real people from the right. community he was very engaged in that yeah, yeah. and that was like a very i i'm not i don't want to speak for him but i know he was very excited about that and on our first call with him he was like basically saying like don't don't go away from this approach. Like, and I'm like into this yeah. approach. So I think that's also like a helpful thing because not only it, it, it tells the people that are making the decisions, like you're not, you're not going to just stay in creative space. Yeah. You're not gonna be in the clouds. Cause once we say yes to you, it's gonna get real pragmatic, real fast. So right. if you're, if you have the ability to pitch, but in creative terms, not like here's my DP and this is what we'll do with light, like, but like, <laughs> That's how the, all filmmakers you, sound. I wouldn't, talk, I wouldn't talk that way, first of all. <laughs> Don't use that voice. If your voice sounds self. like that, make sure but, you change it. <laughs> but also, like, what's creative about the way you want to make it? Yeah. What they, realize, what they don't realize they're actually getting when you go over your creative process is that you have a command of production. You're actually yeah. able to prove to them that, like, 
and you know what you you know what you're looking for in terms of finishing work and who you want to work with in terms of composing or what you're thinking about the score it's like you <clears> want them to not feel like they're getting a lecture about how you do it but at the end of it they go wait this person i think actually like all of a sudden i'm picturing a finished product and this yeah, person yeah. is at the helm of it the entire time so like whatever materials information passion you can give towards like a holistic pitch i think is helpful um at least in our experience yeah i would echo that i think there's um thankful for my background you know when i worked for this producer sam mercer like by the time i think i'd worked for him for four or five years by the time i was done working with him i was running like second units on huge massive movies and so it's like i had a a very strong understanding of like the production realities right, right. and where that pays the biggest dividend is when I had to sit in front of a bond company, which essentially for lack of a better term is like ensuring the financier that this filmmaker will deliver it. And you're, it's like, you're sitting in before a room of judges. I mean, it did feel like yeah. that a lot. It, it actually helped that they had bonded a lot of Sam Mercer's films. who I worked with and they were like, Oh my God, you worked for Sam. But I actually had to give them like, I gave them a diagnostic on how I work. I spreadsheet every shot. I literally have, always have dual spreadsheets. I have one that's the edit in my mind, and then I have one in shooting order, like 80 pages long on a feature. And I'm like meticulous about it, and I sit with my AD, and I sit with the DP together, like we're like a triangle, and we go through every single day, every week, and it's like, how do we maximize time? And it's like, you know, because I know How do we that, maximize horses? How do I maximize <laughs> horses, you know? Don't yeah, don't make your first movie with horses. And they're too. just That'll sitting. Suck up a lot of they're your just time. sitting there writing notes. Just make like, what are they? Are you talking about the AD and DP? No, the uh, the, the bond, bond company. company. Well, what they're assessing is like, can this filmmaker? He may, you know, he or she may have this like really strong vision, but can they execute yeah, yeah, it on yeah. budget? Yeah. Can they make this in this many days for this amount of money? That's yeah. basically there. Yeah, because we were looking. Staring well, wait, how many the, days did you guys shoot? Twenty. So we're staring That's down so the fast, dude. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're staring down the barrel of like an insane task to pull off what's on the page, and they're trying to assess like, should we bond to this film? So how many how many days could Idris be on? Like, did he have like fifteen days or something? No, or? he had uh, eleven. <laughs> yeah, we got him for a twelfth though. No, we got him for a twelfth during production. I I weaseled another day out of him, but that was. If you haven't seen the movie, like for people listening watching like he's in so much of the movie yeah it's a real uh, art <laughs> like it's not like he plays like a supporting role yeah. it's not like at a food stand for him one no. scene like <laughs> waving but yeah. this is what happened when the when the schedule went from 30 days to 25 days to 20 days and his days went from 20 to 18 to 15 to 12 and it kept going down the thing we kept saying is like i remember at 12 we're like oh my god but they're like, he can do it if it's 12 days. Um, Dan and I said to each other, if you if we flash back 10 years and someone said, hey, you get to make a movie with Idris Elba, but he can only be for there for 12 days, You'd, yeah, of I'd course. write that script. So yeah. that's what we did. We went back to the script. And so we you had to cut, rewrite. Yeah, we cut out scenes. Interesting. We gave scenes to other characters. Uh, ultimately, I think that pressing down made it stronger. Yeah, yeah, I would have loved process. for him to be in more of the film, but... I mean, you would never would, know. You would it does, never know. It yeah. doesn't feel like an incomplete arc for him. He right. still feels like which was part of the rewriting process. It's like where do we how do we not lose how do we not lose him narratively? And like, how do we just pack scenes with more punch and emotion that was in dispersed out? So did it go from like a hundred pages to eighty pages or like what was the actual cut? Yeah, I think it went down. Yeah. It went from a hundred, like maybe five to I think our final shooting script is eighty eight pages. You, you, it's always a, a, the pressure of time and money. It never changes. But you get into post and you're like, I didn't need this at all. Yeah. Like, and it's. No, I the, mean, it, 88 pages became a two hour and 47 minute yeah. first cut. <laughs> that was our <laughs> first <laughs> cut. <It's> <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm like, what if we had all those other pages? Like, yeah. what would we do? A four yeah. hour movie here. Yeah. So, real quick before we go, I would be remiss if um, I didn't. I do want to get a quick story from you if it's okay. But. Could you tell me a little bit to people who don't know about the um, formerly incarcerated um, uh, inmates that you use and like, how did that, did that work in Concrete Cowboys at all? Did they come and work in, can you just kind of give me that story real quick before we finish? Yeah. So we founded the company Neighborhood with a mission specifically to be able to hire an apprentice, adults returning home from incarceration. 
Uh, we're in moving in our 12th year now doing it, which is insane. Um, but in terms of, I mean, it connects thus far to all our projects. Uh, the cage was bred out of a relationship with an apprentice and then one of my good friends. I lived in that neighborhood. Wow. Um, yeah, the cage actually started out as a nonprofit video for a guy that runs a basketball camp. <laughs> Uh, he still uses it. But real hard hitting. A real hard hitting. Camp video. But he shows it to his kids. Like, this is your choice. Yeah. Like, sorry your life's harder than most, but this is your choice. He still uses it. I'm on his board. It's called Give and Go Athletics for the those who want to get involved. It's someone amazing. Uh, but then Concrete Cowboy actually came out of a relationship with a gentleman named Eric Miller. So we speak every year in court to pitch our apprenticeship to recruits. Um, that go through this, these two judges run this re-entry program for those who have qualified to be a part of it, essentially a career development. So we've partnered with them specifically. Yeah, so Dan and I are up there doing our thing. We always have the former apprentice speak about their time mm -hmm. at the company. And this gentleman that was in court that day had been home a week. And part of this re-entry is that they stand before a judge uh, bi-weekly to basically with accountability, like what do you need uh, for a year off their parole? Um, or probation. And then, so this guy, Eric Miller stands up and again, has been home a week, talks, telling the judge how he already, already bought a horse and is looking to buy another one. We're like, I haven't been to jail. I haven't been out of jail for a week, but I don't think buying a horse is probably like the best use of money. Um, <laughs> or just what I would Or just what go I would to. do in general, living in Philadelphia. Uh, we had like shot a commercial with the Cowboys down there and um, we everyone kind of knows about the culture there. Uh, but yeah, we just struck up a relationship conversation with this guy. The cage was getting some heat. Um, this even predates Rich. Um, and I was like, well, we should make a movie with these guys. Could that be yeah. awesome? We could use the real cowboys. And he was the first one that introduced us, Eric, to the idea that their entire culture was actually facing like complete extinction because they were going to be gentrified out. So I was like, well, now that's hitting like a mission level for us. Yeah. Like, what if we could actually make something? that you know could save this heritage this intangible heritage in philadelphia that people are completely discarding um, i mean thankfully now some nonprofits have been bred out of the film and they have their own land that the city's given them and stuff it's incredible but yeah our apprenticeship i mean obviously because we did that we would have never met eric mm -hmm. um you know a really beautiful story from the film is a previous apprentice from like actually on the cage uh this guy andrew had like fallen back into some hard decisions and found himself locked up again. Uh, but it really broke my heart that he wasn't going to be a part of Concrete Cowboy because he was so integral to getting the cage made. Like if you watch the behind the scenes on the cage, Andrew's in it. Um, and so I like emailed this lawyer and I was like, is there any way that like we could get him out of jail? Like I feel like I could, I could do better with his time <laughs> than him being locked up. And he's like, well, why don't you write me a letter of what you're thinking and I'll put it before the judge next time I'm there. And so and he wasn't even, on, he wasn't even, sorry, just he wasn't like under a sentence either. He was waiting trial. Like right. he was not yeah, he was waiting sitting trial. without bail. Yeah. yeah. So I write this, you know, I'm a writer, as you just learned. Um, <laughs> and I, uh, I wrote this letter, this, you know, Rich Cook love letter thing to the, to the judge about like how important Andrew was into my life this project getting made, it's legit. This is, I gave links to like press releases, like this is actually happening, whatever. And so I write this letter on our letterhead, everything I can do. Um, and then I get this call uh, from the lawyer. He's like, it worked. She's gonna let him out so long as you hire him. And um, why would you be crying? Why not? Yeah, why not? Um, I don't know. It like makes me, um, it's a miracle. Like, um, she let him out and so long as he was good on it, she like dropped his case. And I mean, he's got a wife and it's just amazing. <laughs> That's all I did. Dude, it's more than all good. And he became like a literal integral part of the team that made Concrete Cowboy. Like literally like was. I couldn't so, have done it without him yeah. again. And no. it's just like, um, yeah, people don't know. It's like, I think filmmaking can do so much. And to be able to see, like, um, that it worked, it's like, you know, like, um, yeah, it's just, I mean, our apprenticeship is the identity of our company. Like, it's, you can't, it's the DNA um, is an outflow of 
our like mission while we have time on this planet. Um, and so as there is no separation, it is like, it's why concrete cowboy even existed or even I knew to tell that story for these guys. And the art that you guys make comes from the overflow of just life that you get to live. You know what I mean? Which is, is so visible in their work. So visible, just like when you guys spend time, if anybody gets to spend time with you, it's like this, the art and the, the extra sort of, is the extra that we get to do because we've one, because we sacrificed a lot just to be able to do it, you know, cause we love it so much, but also because we don't cherish it. Like we don't hold on to it. Like you, like you said, like, it's not this, um, precious, precious. Yeah. not to be super Lord of the Ringsy, but <laughs> thank you guys for being here. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thanks for having us, man. Yeah. Michael, Ooh. Dan, Ricky, see you guys next time. Honor. All right. Thank All right. You. Next time on the Music Bed Podcast, we chat with Grammy Award-winning director Cal Matic. When I did O-Town Road, like, I was directing Chris Rock. You know, Lil Nas X is, like, running away with the money, and they stop chasing him. And Chris Rock says, like, When you see a black man on a horse going that fast, you just gotta let him fly. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I, I wrote that. If I could write a joke for Chris Rock film him, direct him, have this whole sequence, and like, I can do a movie. I can do this 80 more times, you know what I'm saying? This podcast is a production of MusicBit, the standard of music licensing for film, TV, and advertising. If you enjoyed this episode, share it with another filmmaker you know, and subscribe to be notified for the next episodes. 